this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, 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 let it shine.
Good morning. Welcome to the Church of St. Paul and the Redeemer as we celebrate the second Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost. Whether you're a new visitor or a longtime member, whether you live near or far away from the church, we are so glad to be worshiping with you today and hope that you will join us in our mission to mirror the radical hospitality practiced by Jesus. Our service today will follow morning prayer right to from the Book of Common Prayer of the Episcopal Church. You'll find everything you need to follow the service in the subtitles at the bottom of your screen. Welcome, and may God bless you as we continue to find new ways to worship together, even while we are geographically apart. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Mother of us all, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. I will walk in the presence of God. I will walk in the land of the living. I will walk in the presence of God. I will walk in the land of the living. I love you, O God, because you have heard the voice of my supplication, because you have inclined your ear to me whenever I called upon you. I will walk in the presence of God. I will walk in the land of the living. 
how shall I repay God for all the good things done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of God. I will walk in the presence of God. I will walk in the land of the living. I will fulfill my vows to God in the presence of all people. Precious in your sight, O God, is the death of your servants. I will walk in the presence of God. I will walk in the land of the living. O God, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon your holy name. I will walk in the presence of God. I will walk in the land of the living. I will fulfill my vows to you in the presence of all your people, in the courts of God's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. I will walk in the presence of God. I will walk in the land of the living. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you, in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. 
he said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as the Lord had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as they had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits, 
to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff. For laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As some of you know, 
Anne and I returned a few days ago after spending a semester in New Haven, Connecticut. I served as associate dean of Berkeley Divinity School, the Episcopal Seminary at Yale. And as you might guess, it was not the semester that Anne and I imagined it to be. One of my assignments was to teach a course in the pastoral offices. That's a quaint name for the prayer book rituals of baptism, marriage, confession, healing, and burial. It was a kind of how-to-do-it course for the soon-to-be-ordained. I designed the course as a practicum, and that made for a lot of entertaining role-playing in the seminary chapel. All went well right up to spring break. In our last class, before we scattered, there was a demonstration of the prayer book rite of healing. Working in pairs, we laid hands on each other's heads, having first asked permission from our partners, and then we anointed each other with oil. We reflected long and hard on this experience of sacred touch. We knew that the act of healing touch was Jesus' most characteristic gesture. But we also knew that the experience of touch, even and maybe especially in church, is problematic for so many in these days of sexual misconduct and trigger signals. Our practicum experience made relevant the old evangelical question in times like this, what would Jesus do? Well, we had no idea how appropriate and how ironic that question would seem in retrospect. Just before Holy Week, my students returned to Yale and to New Haven as to a different world. We were separated from each other in lockdown, the campus buildings closed and bolted. No touch allowed, except the touch of our laptop keyboards. No sight allowed, except the worried faces on our Zoom screens where we were arrayed like third-rate celebrities on Hollywood squares. The irony of our separation was made even deeper by our first Zoom topic. While the global death toll mounted, we reviewed the rites of burial. Well, like the rest of my colleagues, I radically reshaped the syllabus to respond to the pandemic. I canceled the final two papers and instead challenged everyone to design a ritual of healing and reconciliation to be performed when they imagined the pandemic might be over. When the term was over, I was glad to say that in spite of the pandemic, all my students managed to find jobs in parishes and chaplaincies. But I, I now wonder how in their new circumstances, my students would reshape the services of reconciliation they imagined for the end of the pandemic in the light of what has happened since our virtual commencement on May 18th. With the murder of George Floyd, the massive demonstrations, the egregious misconduct of the president, the harsh spotlight on police violence, the exposure of systemic racism that has stained this country since before its founding, and what is finally being recognized along with the genocide of Native Americans as this country's original sin. Well, the pandemic continues to rage, summer weather and our own restlessness notwithstanding. Burial, as far as pastoral offices go, we can all get our heads around. Burials will sadly continue. But what about healing? What about reconciliation? Where are healing and reconciliation to be found in these violent and pestilent times? When my own anger and frustration, I confess, I have no answer, likely any more than you do. But as a Christian believer, a believer however shaky these days, I know I need to take today's gospel seriously 
however angry and frustrated and useless I feel. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Well, Jesus is the way of healing. I, I need to stand back, take a breath, and recognize the healing ministry that Jesus modeled has been made flesh in the self-sacrifice of nurses, doctors, and medical professionals in this pandemic. Jesus is the way of truth. I need to think of Jesus before Pilate in the Praetorium. Pilate was the tyrant who, like our own wannabe despot in the White House, had no regard for truth. What is truth? Pilate spit it out to a fawning crowd of sycophants. Sound familiar? I try to think of Jesus' courage before Pilate as I contemplate the witness of countless demonstrators throughout the world demanding justice and truth-telling to those in power, a power derived from generations of white privilege. Now, if you decide to join one of those demonstrations, whether in body or in spirit, I hope you will remember the courage of Jesus before Pilate. And finally, Jesus is the way of life, life, even in these wretched times when the grief of a deadly pandemic is compounded by the horror of watching a latter-day lynching recorded on camera in real time. Well, I'm glad to be home. And I, I did like being with seminarians again this past spring. They gave me hope for the future of the church, as uncertain as the church's future seems to be. I hope also that my students are still okay, wherever they are. But I also hope that they get it. If we were still in class, given the events of the past few weeks, I think I would tell them that for any pastoral offices to matter in these times, we need radically to reshape them into sacraments of justice and truth-telling. So what might that mean in, in practice? Well, I can think of three things, at least. One, that in whatever way is open to us, ritually or otherwise, we must make clear with what we say and in what we do, make clear to those who stumble and are afraid in these days of truth-telling, especially our white neighbors, especially people like me. We must make clear that the way of peace is by necessity the way of justice. Two, that in whatever way we can, ritually or otherwise, we must insist on truth when lies like tear gas poison the air. And then finally, in whatever way is open to us, ritually or otherwise, we must stand against violence in murderous times. Stand up against the fanatic stoning of Stephen all those centuries ago. Stand up against the eight-minute, 46-second asphyxiation of George Floyd in a nondescript Minneapolis parking lot under the knee of a callous white cop. In standing against violence, in Jesus' name, we stand up for life and life abundant whatever our felt need for security might be, whatever our loss of a sense of privilege. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Will God help us in these perilous days to act as if we knew it? Let us confess the faith of the Church. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Creator God, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. We give thanks for Willa, Sammy, Rachel, Lucia, David, John, Gloria, Sarah, Delaney, and Zoe as they begin another year, and for Elaine and Patrick, Vance and Diane, Phil and Melissa, and Peter and Jill as they celebrate their anniversary. Give them grace to do your will in all that they undertake, that their works may find favor in your sight. We pray for Linda, Sandy, Carol, Brenda, Van, Pearl, Helen, Darnell, George, Audrey, James, Marion, Joseph, Sally and her family, Eli, Rock, William, Cheryl, Henry, Sophie, Naomi, George, Sean, Tim, William, Jewel, Leatrice, Catherine, Bronwyn, Chris, and Barbara, as well as their caregivers. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. We remember especially Mabel and Michael. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. I invite your intercessions and thanksgivings, either silently or aloud. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the Church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. It's always bittersweet to say goodbye to people in our community, even when they're going on to great new things. Today we have the privilege and the sorrow of offering a rite of leave-taking for Robert and Cherith Nordling as they prepare to move to be closer to family. I'll let Robert address you directly. 
Hello friends from St. Paul and the Redeemer. I'm Robert Nordling and uh, like most of you, I'm sure we have missed you very much over these last few months, missed the chance to be together and worship together. And uh, so it's with a special sense of grief that I have to buy, send this message to you via video um, that my wife Cherith and I uh, will be moving from Chicago in early July to Grand Rapids, Michigan. My son and his wife and our granddaughter uh, have just uh, moved there to take jobs. My mother and father still live there. And so this is a chance for us to have four generations of our family together in that, uh, in that place. And so we're gonna take the opportunity to do that. Um, St. Paul and the Redeemer has been such a gift to us over these last seven years. It's been a place to meet neighbors and create friends. Um, it's been a place to do care and ministry in the neighborhood here, watching how the church cares for the parish that it lives within. It's been a place to gather for some amazing musical experiences. Thank you, Christian. It's also been the place where we gather together as the people of God in this place around the communion table, week after week after week, watching the many become one, watching all of our differences and diversities celebrated, becoming unified together as we pray, as we read the scriptures, as we sing, and as we take communion together. We will treasure that forever as we move on to this next chapter in our life. So thank you so much for being that to us, being that with us. We pray God's de deepest and richest blessing on St. Paul and the Redeemer. And I'm sure that we'll see you again soon as we come back for visits. Take care. We have been blessed with the presence, prayers, and gifts of Robert and Sherith Nordling. God calls them to take their leave and engage in new ministries that the witness they have so generously offered here may be spread elsewhere. Robert and Sherith, we give thanks for your time among us, for your gifts and for your accomplishments. Where there has been hurt, let it be forgiven. Where there has been growth and joy, let us be thankful. Let us pray. Dear God, be with those who leave and with those who stay and grant that all of us by drawing ever nearer to you may always be close to each other in the communion of your saints. All this we ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lives but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be glory and honor throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.